All right, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Jared Simpson. Uh, a few words about myself uh, before I start into the lecture. So I'm a prin principal investigator here at OICR. I work uh, just upstairs on the sixth floor. Uh, my research group uh, develops algorithms for processing sequencing data. So like the type of things we're going to talk about here today, mapping reads to reference genomes, finding rearrangements, genome assemblies, that's the sort of thing that I work on in my group. Um, in addition to being a PI here at OICR, it also has a position in the computer science department across the street at the university. Um, I've been working in bioinformatics for just under 10 years now. Um, prior to being in bioinformatics, I made video games. I was a software engineer at Electronic Arts uh, out in Vancouver. And before that, I was a computer scientist um, studying at the University of British Columbia. So this module is really about um, some of the most fundamental things that we do with, with DNA sequencing data for either cancer genomes or indeed normal genomes as well. And that's uh, finding out where the reads might map onto a reference genome and then trying to use those mapped reads to discover uh, patterns of variation. Uh, so I'm going to go over that. So this, this module has really four parts. There's going to be uh, a lecture on, on genome mapping, which is right now. Then you'll do a tutorial that's on uh, GitHub where you get a chance to, to be hands-on with some of the mapping tools that we most commonly use in the field. Um, then we'll have a bit of a break. I'll come back, talk about genome rearrangements, uh, and then there'll be a tutorial on genome rearrangements as well. Um, I prefer I like answering questions better than, than, than lecturing, so please feel free to ask questions as as they come up uh, while I'm going through this material. Right, so uh, here are the objectives for this module. Um, first and foremost, I, I want you to understand what we mean when we talk about mapping reads to a reference genome. Uh, I'll elaborate on that in just a little bit. Um, also, I want you to understand the common file formats that, you, uh, that you'll be using when you work with sequencing data. Uh, so the input, the, 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 the data comes off the sequencer, comes in the FASTQ format. Um, and then the, the files that you use to work with reads mapped or reads aligned to a reference genome are in what's called the SAM and BAM format. I'll go over all of those um, in this lecture. Um, also, I want you to understand the common terminology we use when we talk about mapping reads like mapping qualities, mismapped reads, and so on, so that when, when you're getting help from someone or when you're trying to talk to people about uh, about some aligned data, uh, you, you know what people are talking about these these various terms. Um, and in the second half of the lab, we'll talk about how we find genome rearrangements using uh, read pairs. And read pairs is one of these terms I'll explain later. Uh, and then finally, in the tutorial, um, you'll have a chance to actually run a mapper on your own and a rearrangement caller as well on uh, real data. Right, so when I entered bioinformatics about 10 years ago, um, it was really the start of this era of, of very high throughput sequencing. Um, prior to, to the introduction of the Selexa, which eventually became the Illumina sequencing instruments, um, the dominant way of sequencing genomes was using capillary-based sequencing based on Sanger chemistry, and that was relatively uh, low throughput instruments. Um, you could get maybe a few hundred megabases of data per run, uh, but not much more than that, not, and really not enough to routinely sequence human genomes. Uh, but since these high-throughput short-read sequencers have been invented and, and widely deployed in the field, we're now able to sequence genomes routinely. Um, at the top end of this scale here, which is really just uh, a depiction of the, the throughputs of various sequencing instruments, is the, uh, the Illumina HiSeq sequencer, which gives you about 600 gigabases of data um, over a 10-day run. Um, this has completely changed how we do cancer genomics. It's now cheap enough that we can sequence cancer genomes routinely. Um, and the content of this, this module is really how we analyze data coming off of that, uh, of those sequences. So a little bit about the Illumina sequence in chemistry and how it works. Um, it's a cycle-based instrument where um, nucleotides are added cycle by cycle to a growing, cha uh, growing DNA molecule. Um, so it's based on fluorescence, and what happens is that, do you pointer? Uh, well, I'm going to neglect one side of the half room, so I won't use that. But what happens is that the nucleotides are being added to this growing molecule of DNA are labeled uh, with a fluorescent tag with one of four colors. And a laser is used to excite that, that fluorescent tag, and then 
uh, a camera captures what the color is for that, uh, that stage of the reaction. Um, so in, in, on the left-hand side here, we have a single T that's being added to this, uh, th this molecule of DNA. And then as the uh, reaction progresses, a G was added, a C was added, a T was added, and so on. Now, on, to on the flow cell that these DNA molecules are uh, attached to, you perform amplification to amplify what's a single molecule into this cluster of thousands or tens of thousands of molecules. And this gives you this, this circular area on there. All of those molecules should have the same color at the same time. And literally, in sequencing the DNA is just reading off the patterns of colors. So if you see blue followed by uh, green, that means it's TG and so on. You're just reading the color. Yeah, question? What does it mean when your sequencing provider tells you that the clusters were too close to each other? Uh -huh. And then the base quality deteriorates because of that. Yeah. So the the, the base calling algorithm it um, is trying to figure out what what this order of colors was, what the sequence of colors was. If the clusters overlap, it will look like a mixed signal where you might it might look like it's both G, um, blue and green at the same time, and then it can't say for that that part of the flow cell what the sequence was. Is that the issue with the DNA you're sending for sequencing, or is that just how? So usually, you have to fairly carefully control the concentration of DNA that you add to the flow cell. If you add too much, the density is too high, and you start to get overlapping clusters. So the software that, that, that base calls will try to detect that, and then either it will say, okay, these clusters aren't useful for sequencing, um, or it might just get, get confused if it can't detect those. So it's basically you, you want to try to get your concentration in the sort of the Goldilocks range where it's not too high, where you're getting overlapping clusters, but it's not so low that you're just not sequencing very much. Oh, and if you're in the perfect high spot, you get more throughput. As you get more exactly. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. can you explain a lot more than that concept of amplification of what you exactly amplify? Yeah, so you, you start with, um, so, you, so you have your, a DNA molecule. And then on the, the surface of the flow cell, there's adapter sequences. Um, the DNA molecules come in, they bind to the adapter sequences, and then one strand of the DNA um, gets, gets cleaved off, okay? And then there's, um, the DNA is then like sticking up vertically on the flow cell. It bends down uh, to another adapter that's complementary to the other half of the DNA. And then there's the, what's called bridge PCR that happens where that, that, that bent molecule of DNA gets progressively amplified into a cluster. Did you have a question back here? Sitting there? Okay. Um, right, so uh, here's a term that, uh, that you should start to be familiar with, and that's base calling. Uh, base calling just means to take this, this stack of microscoped images where each one of these individual colored dots is one of these clusters and figure out what the sequence of, of nucleotides was um, for each one of these clusters. So it's just transforming from these images to an ASCII file in FASTQ format um, which with the sequence of each one of these uh, molecules. So every point of time this cap these images are sequentially captured and analyzed? That's right. Yeah, so the, the cycle-based chemistry is, so it'll flow nucleotides on there, they'll, they'll get incorporated, a laser will excite them, it'll image them, and then there's a blocking group that doesn't allow the DNA molecule to, um, to, to grow any further. That blocking group then gets removed, and then the cycle continues. Excuse me. Yeah. Can I sure. It reads in this order, line by line. Um, yeah, when we read the, the file, we read... Um, no, the file, but how do you get from the image on the left to the file on the right? So this image is just for one cycle. Um, so you'll, you'll have 100 of these images uh, stacked up. So this is, let's say this, this image is for the first base of the read. Um, for each one of these clusters, we'll say it's okay, A, C, G, or T. And then 30 minutes later, you take a second image after the, the chemistry has progressed. Um, and then from that layer of image, you'd, you'd find the same clusters in, in these images, and you'd read off the color for the, the base at that time. So this whole thing is for one base? This, this image is for one base for how many dots are on there? Maybe 10,000? 
So it's 10,000 reads, one base of 10,000 reads. They're all the same. They're all doing the first base or the second base. They're all, it's lockstep chemistry. So in the 50th cycle, you're reading the 50th base of every one of the molecules. But, but each, each spot is a different piece, potentially. Each spot is a, is a different DNA yeah. molecule. Yeah. yeah. One of the lines <coughs> correspond to the position. Yeah, actually. In, um, in, in, this is the name of the read, the first line. And these, uh, I believe it's these two, oh, sorry, it's, it's these two numbers. Uh, I'm looking at the last two numbers in the first line. That's the coordinate of the dot on the flow side. Mm -hmm. Okay, so no sequencing technology is perfect. Um, all, sequencing te all sequencers make errors in various ways. Uh, one of the sources of errors of illuminate uh, sequencing chemistry is what's called phasing and prephasing. And as I, I've just explained, these molecules are being extended one base at a time in lockstep, where all of the molecules in the cluster should be at the 50th base and have uh, 50 nucleotides incorporated in them. Now, that all doesn't always work perfectly, and some molecules can go ahead and some molecules can fall behind. And when some Molecules in the cluster fall behind, it's called phasing, and when some of them go ahead, it's called prephasing. And what happens is that when, this ha um, when you get phasing and prephasing, the color in that cluster becomes a mixture. If, if some molecules are down on the G base, you'll have some red signal, whereas the other ones are blue or green. And that gives you a mixture, and this makes it more difficult for the, uh, the base caller to determine what the sequence of that, uh, that colony of reads was, or that cluster of reads was. So this will just go by majority and then lower the quality of the read? Of the yeah, exactly. So when I come to quality scores, this is what determines the quality score, is, is this phasing and prephasing. Um, it's a bit more complicated than majority. It, it has a statistical model of how often things fall behind or fall ahead. But yeah, that, that's the general idea. Each of these is a different molecule. Why, why does this matter? So right now I'm talking about within, what, within each one of these dots, within a cluster. Within the cluster, they're all in the same molecule. But from the different dots, they're different molecules. So this is the errors that occur within one cluster. Okay, because of these, these uh, chemistry problems or uh, error modes, there's, each sequencing technology has its, a, a unique error profile, which is dependent on, on the chemistry of it. Uh, so the Illumina sequencer, which is what we mostly work with uh, in cancer genomics, uh, it has a very low error rate, roughly 1 in 200 bases or errors, and most of the times when an error occurs, uh, it's a substitution error where the sequencer just said, okay, there's a G at this position when it was actually a T uh, or any other type of substitution. Um, other sequencers like the 454 or the ion torrent have mostly insertion and deletion errors within uh, homopolymer runs. Um, and then the single molecule sequencers, which aren't, which aren't measuring uh, a cluster of molecules, but it's just measuring off of a single molecule DNA, which, which is much more noisy, uh, they have a higher error rate of about 10 to 20 percent, uh, and the errors tend to be a mixture of insertions, deletions, uh, and, and substitutes. And the single molecule sequencers are by PacBio, and one that I work on quite a lot, which is the Oxford Nanopore sequencer. So maybe you're going to cover this, so feel free to sidestep it. With the single molecule ones, they have higher error rate even when you account for the error introduced by implementation in the other stuff? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the error rate in the single molecule ones is, is just intrinsic to having to measure off of basically oh, single base. Yeah. Yeah. And something so important to understand when you look at your, your own data is that um, the Illumina error pro profile isn't constant across the read. The chance of having a substitution base is dependent on um, the position from the start of the base. And, and errors tend to increase towards the three prime end of the sequence. Uh, here's a plot of the error rate uh, per position for six different Illumina runs. And you can see that for all of the runs, the error rate is starting to creep up. Uh, towards the end of the read at this hundredth uh, base position. 
So while the error rate's around one in a thousand at the start of the read, it can be a few percent at the end of the read. And this will be reflected in co the quality scores of your reads. Um, and also you should, something you should be aware of when you're, you're trying to say call SNPs as the, the bases towards the end of the read aren't as, uh, aren't as reliable. So could you trim to 100 in this case? For this, this, yeah, so one of the runs here was out to 150 bases, and you can see that the error rate's around 3% at the end. Probably worth trimming that back to, say, maybe 120 or even 100, just to keep the best data. So when you said towards the end of the read, and you, then you said it, towards the three prime. Yeah. Uh, so what about the reverse one? Is that, is, are the reads at the beginning are more prone to mistake, or... No, towards the five prime. It's always towards uh, the three prime end. Um, so in in so for the, the when you sequence a read pair, which is something I'll come to, um, it's sequencing. So the first read will be on the forward strand of the reference. The second read will be on the reverse strand. Um, so when you look at in reference coordinates, it would be the lower coordinate with the the higher error rate, but it, we always think about the errors in terms of the strand that was actually sequenced. So it's always a three prime end of the piece that was of the strand that was sequenced. I can I can I can come back to that. Did we have a question right here? Yeah, so this graph would also demonstrate how if you had hundred readings, it would be the average, which is you know, which would be hundred and more So if you sequence the genome and then you had like a hundred reads at some position, do you mean or? Each uh, so this is averaged over a lot of reads. Um, yeah, yeah. So Did we have a question? Does happen that the error rate goes up? Why does it happen? Yeah. So it's exactly um, this. So as these. As these, you have this cluster of 10,000 molecules, they're all in lockstep, incorporating the same base. Um, and as that reaction progresses and you're getting towards the end of the reads, more of them have gotten out of phase. So the, the, the signal purity, they call it, is lower at the end of the read. So this, if that's the case, then in theory, if you had a shorter reaction than the error read, it's like the longer the reaction goes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you can see it in this one. So the, the read that's, or the, the set of reads that's 150 bases in this case had the highest error rate. And all of the longer ones, the error rate creeps up. Is the error rate or uh, specificity of error random, or it offers in the same cycle? Like if you, for example, if you use FFT, formal and fixed, uh, yeah. the normal period, which is normally degraded and not oxidated. So the error rate is random, or? That is some it's not random, and, and, and that's a very good point because it, it depends. This is one source of the errors, this, this phasing and free phasing. PCR amplification can introduce errors. It can introduce stutter in, in simple repeats. FFPE damages DNA, and you get this, these, these cross links between thymines, and, and all of those things contribute to the, contribute to the error. So it's not random, and it, and it depends on how you've prepared the DNA. So a very, the highest accuracy way that people sequence is doing PCR-free libraries, where you don't do any PCR step, you're just getting the, the unmodified DNA onto the sequencer, and, and that tends to have better properties than if you're amplifying it or, or using FFP. FFP is the, the hardest to sequence, probably. Okay, so now I'll explain. Yeah. Even without PCR, you still want to have the bridge amplification for to create the cluster, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, when, when we say PCR, we mean when you uh, ligate adapters to sequence, there's usually a PCR step as well. Um, but the bridge amplification is always there. Yeah. So the FASTQ file is uh, the format that you, uh, you we use when the data comes off of the sequencer. And it's a fairly simple uh, text file format where each sequencing record, so each one of these clusters, which was uh, a colony of DNA molecules, uh, is represented by four lines. And the first line in the FASTQ file is uh, the read name. So this is the identifier of the read. There's structured metadata uh, within this read name, like I was explaining over here, where the, the X and Y coordinates of, uh, of, of where this cluster was on the flow cellar in here, 
there's the instrument name, what flow cell it was run on, but oftentimes we don't deal with that metadata too much, and we just take this long string as being uh, a unique identifier of this read. Um, the second line is the actual base called sequence of the read, so this is just the sequence of nucleotides that the, that the base caller uh, determined from this stack of images. The third line is um, just a, a separator that separates the uh, base called sequence uh, from the base quality scores. And the base quality scores are uh, an estimation that the base caller made of how reliable each one of these nucleotides are. So it's an estimate of whether there was an error at that position or not. Now you look at this and it's, it's just this, uh, these ASCII characters, CCC, FFF, so on. And this is just an encoding of uh, a number that we can print in the file. So when you convert this to a numerical quality score, you just subtract 62 from the ASCII character code for that, and you get what's called uh, the base quality score. The base quality score is a number between 3 and 40, and it's a log-scaled probability that the, that base call is incorrect. So if you see a base quality score with a quality of 40, um, it has about a 1 in 10,000 chance of being wrong. So the, the base caller has said, oh, I'm very confident in this particular base. Conversely, if you see a base quality score of 10, it has about a 10% chance of being incorrect. Um, so if you are looking at SNPs and you're trying to decide whether they're real or not, and all of the reads have a score of Q10, you wouldn't trust it as much as if uh, the reads had a quality score of Q40. Okay, so uh, a read mapping program will take those reads in FASTQ format. Yep. From that ASCII uh, line that you were saying, how do you get that score? So you would take the ASCII character code um, of this, say capital F is going to be something like, I don't know, 80. Uh, I, I don't know the ASCII table in my head. And then you, you subtract. There's a conversion table. There's, there's a conversion table. There's a direct lookup table. But... It, yeah, so, I don't know, the, the ASCII, so, so what we want is this numerical code for it. The ASCII table from 0 to 40 are unprintable characters. You can't print them in a file. So you add an offset into the printable ASCII characters. And I think it's uh, offset of 62, and that gives us these, um, these codes. But for the purposes of working with the data, you can just treat it as a lookup table where F means Q25 or something. So is there a one-to-one -one relationship between the bases that were read and each of the ASCII characters? Yeah, exactly. So this, so this G is the quality score for this sequence. Question in the back. What does what is that set for blue? Say again. What does that set for blue? Yeah, it depends on a few factors. Um, usually, so in You'll get quality scores of three, which are the lowest quality scores, sometimes at the end of the reads, and usually you just want to throw away that information. There's the, the sequencer just basically gave up on calling those bases, and it put the lowest quality score on. Um, usually Q20 to Q30 are the ones that we, we have reasonable confidence in. When you work with a, a SNP calling or a somatic mutation calling program, they'll internally take these quality scores, put them into their probabilistic model, and then make a call for you where you don't have to directly worry about, about the quality scores. So it's really, it's looking at a product of how many reads were showing a particular mutation and the quality scores of those reads as well. So generally speaking, Yes. Yeah. Right, so the read mapper is going to take that FASTQ file and it's going to try to figure out um, where in your reference genome, let's say the human reference genome, those reads came from. Um, so the human reference genome is very large, it has about 3 billion bases, and the reads are extremely short, about uh, 100 bases. So it's commonly referred to as finding a needle in a haystack, where you're trying to find where that 100 base pair read could have come from. Uh, in the human reference genome. So why do we want to do that? Well, of course, when we're sequencing the cancer genome, we're sequencing someone's uh, 
germline genome, we want to know how they're different in comparison to the reference genome. We want to know all of the genome variants uh, that are present in that individual uh, versus this reference. So when we map the reads or align the reads to the reference genome, we can then look at those alignments to call SNPs or things like rearrangements. Um, and as I said, to do this, we need to, we need to map the reads to the reference genome first. Now, you might think that, okay, well, let's just try to compare the, the read to every possible location in the reference genome. Um, but unfortunately, because the human genome is so large and because it's so repetitive, uh, that's really not computationally feasible. So what we have to do is build what's called uh, an index of the reference genome that lets us uh, efficiently look up possible locations where that read might have mapped onto the reference genome. So the, the most popular mapping program, which is called BWA, uh, it uses an index called the burroughs wheeler transform um, to, to rapidly identify the possible locations where a read might have mapped. Um, so working with things like the burroughs wheeler transform is what my research group does. So I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody who's interested about how that algorithm works, but uh, it, it's, it's a bit beyond the, the scope of the course uh, for this lecture. Now, what does the read mapper need to consider when it's mapping reads to a reference genome? Well, first it needs to consider the fact that there are sequencing errors. We can't just look for exact matches between the, this read that we're mapping and the reference genome. We need to consider that there's going to be differences between it because of these, these sequencing errors that we talked about. So the read mapping program must be tolerant about differences between the reads and the reference genome. Uh, so typically what read mappers do is they use this index of the reference genome to find exact matching what we call seeds and then it'll refine the seeds using dynamic programming uh, to determine what the best mapping location for that read is. Um, so the general principle here is that reads that have a lot of errors and insertion and deletion errors in particular are a lot harder to map than reads with just few substitutions like Illumina data. So when, if you're mapping, say, Oxford nanopore data, which has 15% error rate, mixture of insertion and, and deletions, it's much more challenging to map those than, say, uh, an Illumina read that has a single substitution in it over 100 bases. Would you still trust BWA to map nanopore reads compared to other methods that are more specifically designed for? Yeah, well, yes. So. That's a good point, and, and something I wanted to say in the last slide is that you typically choose your mapping program depending on the type of sequencing te technology. So when we're mapping Illumina reads later on, we're going to use BWA MEM. Um, when I map Oxford nanopore reads, I use BWA MEM, but with all, uh, specific options that are designed to, to score yeah, it's predetermined in there. You can just say <coughs> dash X O N T 2D. Um, there are other specialized read mappers for nanopore data like graph map, um, but I, I like to use BWA map. Right, second issue that a mapper needs to keep in mind is that um, short read sequencers generate huge amounts of data. Um, as I said in the, in the second slide, the Lumina run is about 600 gigabases of data over a 10 uh, day run. Um, and that's just a huge amount of data for the, the algorithm to churn through. So we need to select programs that are extremely efficient or else we'll end up um, spending a whole lot of money on just compute time rather than sequencing genomes. So right, so how do you choose a mapper? Well, uh, it needs to be accurate. We don't want it to be making errors where it places the reads on the wrong uh, location of the reference genome. That's a, the major source of false positive variant calls. Uh, it needs to be quite sensitive. It has to allow for differences between the, the sequence individual and the reference genome. And as I just said, it needs to be fast as well. So about four years ago, there was a very nice review paper in bioinformatics about, um, that surveyed all the different mapping programs that are out there. And uh, if, if you're interested in this and, just, and looking at the trade-offs between, um, say, speed and accuracy, this paper goes into it in quite a lot of depth. Um, as you might have figured out, I like the mapping program BWA. A lot of people use that, and it's sort of the standard for Lumina data now, and it's what we're going to use in the tutorial. Um, but just be aware that there's probably been a hundred different mapping programs published over the last 10 years uh, for mapping short reads to a reference genome, and they all sit on a different position of the, the sort of accuracy versus speed curve. 
Okay, so now I'm going to talk about um, some of the terminology with mapping reads to a reference genome, uh, mainly uh, mapping quality. So we can visualize the process of mapping a read to a reference genome like this. Uh, we take our sequence read, uh, which is at the bottom of the slide in red here, and we have our, our long reference genome, which is this black bar here, and we need to figure out uh, where on this reference genome we want to place uh, this short read. So let's say the, the mapping program found three possible locations from it, and from left to right, there's a mapping location where it mapped perfectly to the reference genome. There were no differences between the read and the reference genome. In the middle one, there was a single mismatch between the read and the reference genome. And in the, the one on the right, there are two mismatches between the read and the reference genome. How do we evaluate which of these is the most likely true position for the genome? Uh, and we do this and we represent it using uh, what's called a mapping quality. And just like a base quality where we had this measure of how reliable the base was, the mapping quality is a measure of how reliable uh, this mapping was. So in, in the output file for the aligner, it will say, okay, this is a Q30 uh, mapping. And that means there's roughly one in a thousand chance that the mapper selected the wrong mapping location uh, for that read. So just like when you're looking at SNPs, you want to just look at the ones or, or consider the ones with fairly high quality. Um, when you're looking at your read alignments as well, you want to just consider the ones that were mapped uh, very confidently. And in the exercise, there'll be examples uh, of this that you can look at. Now, what possibly causes mapping errors? Well, if there's a lot of errors in the read, it can confuse the mapper and put it in the wrong position. If the genome is very repetitive and the human genome is very repetitive, uh, it can cause the mapper to put the read in the lo wrong location. And if there's any variation like SNPs and indels between the reference and, and the individual that you've sequenced, uh, that can cause problems as well. So the mapper is the program. Yes, the mapper is the, the, the program. Yeah. Like BWA is, is the mapper in this case. Now, because the Lumina reads are, are fairly short of 100 bases, um, that causes these problems where we might mismap the reads in the, into the wrong location. Uh, so what some people did is they, they developed what we call paired end reads, um, which allows us to increase our confidence in the read mappings. So the idea of paired end reads is that um, you would take a, a longish molecule of DNA, let's say 500 bases, and you'd sequence 100 bases from one end of the read and 100 bases from the other end of the read with the 300 bases in between left unread. So now we have this constraint that we know, okay, we have 200 bases of sequence and they're separated by 300 bases, and that allows the mapper to have more information to know where to place reads. So to illustrate that, let's say we're now sequencing uh, a read pair, we want to figure out where this is. If we map the first half of the pair, there might be two equivalent mapping locations. So let's say it maps to these two positions with one mismatch each, but now we, we wouldn't be able to say which of these is the two mapping locations. They're the exact same, and, and there's no information to resolve the mapping. But if we sequence the read pair, and we then uh, map the, the second half of the read, because we have this constraint that the second half of the read needs to map about 300 bases away, we can then, um, we get a much more re reliable alignment. So in this case, for the first alignment, the second half of the read pair mapped with no differences, whereas in the second alignment, the second half of the pair mapped with six differences. So we'd be much more confident that, okay, the true alignment is this first one, where cumulatively there was only one mismatch versus seven mismatches for the other alignment. Um, this is, yeah, go ahead. And would you always use an insert or like 300 bases between the two apps or is that something that's like tweaked for the different applications? It's usually tweaked for the different applications. It doesn't change much more but than say 200 to 500 bases just because it's really hard to get very long fragments to work on this like bridge amplification. Um, so the upper limit you usually see is about 500. I think it, the field is kind of standardized around 300 as being the common insert size. Well, it, it's not quite independent, but people do do that, and, and it definitely helps. Like as I mentioned before, the error rate goes up towards the end of the read, and so you're reading the noisy bit twice if they overlap. Um, and for things like metagenomics and 16s sequencing, where you want to sequence. 
say, 200 base pair fragments at very high accuracy, people do that quite commonly. You'll see, you'll make the insert size about 180 bases, so they overlap a little bit at the end. That's quite common. Okay. So they're not quite, the, the probability that you have an error at one uh, base pair is not quite independent from the, the other read going in the other direction, but it's still pretty good. It makes it a lot better. It makes it a lot better. Like, it gets rid of um, just the statistical variability caused by these phasing problems overlap between the, the fluorescent spectra for the, 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 the nucleotide tags. What it doesn't get rid of is amplification artifacts. If, if you've amplified your DNA and the amplification made an error, that's going to be read the same way twice. Um, and, and, and it won't fix that. The amplification for the cluster or the PCR that you do beforehand? Um, mainly the PCR that you do beforehand. Yeah. Well, can we this just to the um, to the two read, uh, one read the two angles. Yeah. Um, but then you have overlapping reads over that region. Yes. Are those used as well to figure out how, this, how you put this together? Like independent reads that are from the same location? Right. right. Um, s sort of. Um, usually we, we, we're, we're viewing and when we calculate mapping quality in particular, we just view these two reads as a pair and independent of everything else. We map them to the reference, we estimate mapping quality, then we move on with the next pair. But oh, oh, so you go pair by pair. We go pair by pair, that's right. Um, if you... But when doesn't the, the red line, yeah. doesn't it predict the sequence that would have to be bound by another read pair? Yes. Yeah. But that's not used. It's used downstream. The mapper just treats every read pair as independent. Downstream programs like SNP callers, uh, Intel okay. callers, they'll then use that information. They'll that's look at it. So that's the second level. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's the next layer of information. Okay, coming to the end of, of uh, this half of the lecture, uh, I'll just explain this, the SAM and BAM format. Um, so this was a standard that rose out of... Um, Sanger Institute and the Broad Institute about, say, seven, eight years ago as a way of representing alignments such that you could write a mapping algorithm, you'd write its aligned reads or its mapped reads in some standard format, and then any sort of SNP calling program could just take this, this, this file that's a standard um, instead of having a different uh, file type for every mapping program. So SAM stands for Sequence Alignment Map. Uh, it's a text file. It's just a tab-delimited text file you can read uh, in your terminal. BAM is the compressed version. It contains all of the same information, but it's just a much more compact uh, representation of the alignments so that your, your files don't take up a huge amount of disk space. Uh, so I'll walk through the different fields in the SAM file. Um, so the first field is just the read ID. So this comes straight out of the, uh, that first line of the FASTQ file I showed you earlier. The second uh, field is uh, what we call flags. So this is a binary number uh, or, or a, a number that's uh, just encoding a binary string that um, just gives sing small bits of information like what strand of the reference genome that read mapped to, whether it has a read pair, whether it, uh, the read pairs was mapped in the expected distance and orientation. Um, so to decode this number, you can't just look at this number, which is 99, and figure out what it means. Um, there's online tools that will, 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 will decode this into the different bits of information. Um, and we'll, I think in the, in the exercise after this, it'll, uh, that's described a little bit more. The next fields are the actual chromosome that the uh, read mapped to and its position along the chromosome. So in this case, the read mapped to chromosome 19 um, at about 8.8 .8 megabases. Next field is this mapping quality. So this read got a mapping quality of Q60, which is actually, it's the upper limit for mapping quality. You, you won't see map reads with mapped with a higher than Q60 quality. That means it's about one in a million chance that it was mapped incorrectly, so we could rely on this read. Uh, quite a bit. Next over is what's called the cigar string, and this is a representation of how uh, the bases in the read line up against the bases of the reference genome. And I've given two examples at the bottom of the slide here. 
um, showing an insertion with respect to the reference genome and a deletion with respect to the reference genome. So the one on um, your left is showing a deletion, and we encode this as 4M, 1D, 6M. So the way that we read this is that four bases of the read lined up against four bases of the reference, then one base of the reference was deleted, so we re there was no base in the read that maps to that, so it has uh, just a dash character here, followed by six bases which match between the reference and the read. Um, the other side on the right is uh, an insertion. Here we have 4M, so there's four bases aligned to the reference, one base inserted, and then four bases, uh, again, aligned to the reference. Now something important here, and, and it's a bit subtle, is that these 4M characters, these 4M codes, don't tell you whether the bases between the reference and the read are identical. So in the second position on the right, there's, um, the reference has an A and the read has a T. That still is 4M. It's not trying to say that these are identical bases, it's just saying that they line up against each other. And that's something that people commonly um, get confused about early on with working with these files, is that they want to treat these 4Ms or 10M or whatever it is as an exact match. Um, so next in the, the SAM file is um, the pairing information. So the chromosome that the read pair mapped to, in this case, it's just represented as an equals sign saying that it was the same chromosome. It was chromosome 19 again, uh, followed by the position of the, the read pair and uh, then the actual inferred insert size, so the end-to-end -end distance between, um, between that whole fragment of DNA that was sequenced. Uh, and then we just have the actual sequence of the read, same as what's in the FASTQ file, and the quality score as well. Okay, so in this slide, it's just a list of resources for working with these SAM and BAM files. So the program we'll be using is SAM Tools, which is a toolkit for manipulating these files. We can use it to convert from SAM to BAM, and the other way from BAM to SAM. Um, you can sort the alignments into reference coordinate order, uh, or you can extract all of the alignments for a particular uh, reference location. So now SAM Tools offers a threaded sorting. Yeah. So it's a little bit faster than simple sorting without using threads. Yeah. Can you just say that's faster than Power Tools, which also uses threaded sorting? Uh, I haven't done a head-to-head -head comparison of them. Um, but you would just trust SAM tools. I, I, I trust SAM tools. It's 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 a little easier to, to install. I, I I know Hang Lee very well, so so <laughs> this is my preferred preferred software. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know. Has anybody done a benchmark between SAM tools and Picard? Could talk about the speed. Andrew, do you know? <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say that, but I didn't want to offend any Java programmers. Um, but yeah, generally compiled C programs are a little faster than Java programs. So, so I'd probably, I'd, I'd expect that SAM tools is a bit faster. Yeah, I just discovered the threaded in the car tools before I knew that SAM tools also offers a threaded version because it's taking forever for some of the larger files. Right, right. So the second bullet here is just a link to the, the specification for the SAM file. Um, so if there's anything that you, you read in the SAM file, can't figure out, like, what does this flag mean? What is the exact meaning of these fields? Uh, this is the technical document that all the developers work from. Uh, so this is, this is the ground truth for SAM files. Uh, so have a look at that one to, to answer any questions. If you want help online, you could ask at the SAM Tools mailing list, which is linked here, or any of the online Q&A uh, forums like Biostars or Seek Answers. You can find uh, very helpful people to help you out. Right, so I believe you all had um, a tutorial on IGV already. Is that right? Um, so in the, in the, tu in the module um, coming up where, where you actually will run BWA and you'll use SAM Tools, uh, we'll be using IGV to, to view the aligned reads. IGV gives you a lot of information about the reads. You can get all of these fields during the SAM file, like where the read was mapped, um, where pair was mapped, and so on. And you can view the, the mismatches between reads and the reference genome. So this is an example um, of a somatic mutation. In the bottom is a sequence tumor. 
in the top is a sequence normal, and we can see that there's a single base that was uh, substituted in the tumor that isn't present in the normal. And when you're working with cancer genomics data, you do this sort of thing quite often. You find uh, a mutation in gene that you think is quite interesting, you open up IGV, you navigate to that location, and then you look at the read alignments to see whether, uh, whether you trust that mutation or not. This is quite a good one. All of the reads are aligned with Q60, and all of those bases that are different with respect to the reference uh, have quite high quality scores. Now, but you have to be aware that there are various bits of the reference genome where mapping can go uh, quite wrong. This is an example of reads mapped to uh, the centromere on chromosome 2. Now, when we're sequencing a genome, we're, ra we're randomly sampling reads from that reference genome. And what that means is that we expect that the read coverage to be roughly uniform across the whole genome. So when we see things like really high piles of reads, where the read depth is much higher than we expect, it usually indicates there's some sort of mapping problem. And this, in this case, in the, in the centromere, um, the mapped depth is around 700x. Typically, we sequence a genome to around 30x. And there's these huge peaks where over 8,000 reads are piling up at, uh, at single locations. Um, we wouldn't trust any of these alignments. They're almost certainly just artifacts of the fact that the centromere is incredibly repetitive and it's the same sequence or the same repeat structure shared across all the chromosomes. So we would have little to no confidence um, in these alignments. And you can see these vertical colored bars that would look like SNPs, but because of the fact that, that these are probably artifact alignments, uh, we wouldn't trust any of these SNPs that have been called here. Uh, and finally, um, something to be aware of is uh, soft clipped reads. So this is when BWA is trying to map a read to, to the reference. If it gets to a point where it can map, say, the, the start of the read, but then not map any of the rest of it, it will just stop aligning and only map the, the, the first part that can confidently align. And the rest of the read is considered to be soft clipped. Um, now, this is an example of a real uh, indel in a cancer genome which was too long for BWA to align um, the reads with a gap in it. So what happened is it just soft clipped all of the reads up to the break point and left the rest of the re reads unaligned. This is one of the patterns that, uh, that it looks like. And we'll be getting into this more in the, in the next session, the next lecture, when I talk about ge genome rearrangements. Um, but that's the end of, of uh, these slides. Before we start the read mapping exercise, is there any more questions about uh, mapping reads to reference? Yeah. A question about the reference genome. Yeah. You're mapping a tumor of a patient. That patient's genome, I mean, the germline genome, will be very different from the reference. Yeah. How do you handle that? You usually sequence both um, the normal, which is just, say, a blood sample from lymphocytes or some adjacent tissue, and you also sequence the tumor. Um, and when you go to compare, when you go to find variants, you make sure that there's a lack of evidence for the variant in the normal sample before calling it to be a somatic mutation. And this will be, this will come up in, in some of the other modules as well. In once when I talk about rearrangements, when we talk about somatic mutations, I think tomorrow. So you kind of create a reference genome for each patient. Is all. Yeah. Well, what we usually do, what the programs internally will do, is that. So let's go back a few slides. So in this case, we would look at this position. We might call, I can't read what that is. We might see that there is a C to G mutation. And this is all of the evidence for this mutation in the tumor. And then we would look at the same position in the normal, which is shown here, and see that there's no evidence for it. So the program would be internally integrating all of this evidence. And it would say, OK, there's a somatic mutation, C to G, at this position. So you don't, all oh right, so you're preparing simultaneously the reference that's to his own. That's that exactly right. Yeah, you don't, you usually don't right. construct so like a new reference that. that, just because there's a lot of information that gets lost. In the, uh, and the program is doing it, comparing the cancer to his own to the reference. That's right. Yeah. What are you saying it for the cigar? You said a common misconception about matching being identical. Could you just go over that? And Sure. Um, so for this one here, we have we represent the fact that these this four base stretch matched the reference gene. Okay. 
but this, these bases mismatch. There's a T in a read, but an A in a reference. So why is that matching? Is it, matching? it means that M means that they um, they align against each other, not that they're the same base. So it goes back to, to how we represent dynamic programming, where when you when you align using dynamic programming, if the if you traverse along the diagonal, it means that um, the two the two bases are, are expected to be lined up, and we can we call that a match. Um, it, it, that's where the confusion comes from because you say, okay, they match. It should be the exact same thing, but it doesn't the mean I matches, but the bases may match. exactly. Yeah, they're aligned, but not protect not necessarily identical. Yeah. So the cigar string perhaps the, like, the indels, but not necessarily the snips. Is it also, would you see something in there for the, the larger structural variations? Or would things just kind of fall apart? You, you usually can't do large structure variations with cigar strings. Like inversions, there's not a representation of. Um, usually what will happen, so a cigar example I didn't use is the soft clipping. So there might be, if a read gets soft clipped, it'll say 50S. And that just means that the last 50 bases of the read weren't aligned. So usually when you get structural variation, you end up with soft clip reads like that. Okay, if that's all the questions, uh, let's move on to the exercise. Um, here's the second part of the module, which is covering uh, genome rearrangements. I hope you all got on well uh, with the read mapping exercise. Uh, so I'll give a brief um, lecture, probably only about 10, 15 minutes, about finding rearrangements. Then we'll do a second lab um, where you actually have a chance to run uh, a rearrangement detector on the BAM file that you generated uh, in the first part of the lab. So there's a lot of different types of variation that we want to find uh, when we sequence a genome. We have uh, single nucleotide variants like just substitutions or uh, SNPs. You have insertions and deletions where bits of DNA has either been deleted from the genome or, uh, or inserted. And then you have different classes of structural variation, which are larger types of variants, um, which, which are usually quite drastic changes to the chromosomes. Uh, this module is going to focus on just the structural variations. Um, later on, you'll hear about gene fusions. And then uh, tomorrow, you'll hear about uh, calling single nucleotide variants and insertions and deletions as well. So the class of structural variations really encompasses uh, different variant types from very large insertions and deletions like megabase scale uh, deletions, inversions where bits of the chromosome get flipped, uh, translocations where you swap material uh, between different chromosomes, and copy number variation where you, where you can have uh, duplications of, of large parts of the chromosome. Um, so the typical way of finding structure variation is using these paired end reads that we uh, discussed in the first part of the lab. So here's an overview of how you generate uh, paired end reads from genomic DNA. So you start with uh, you start with your genome, you then uh, fragment it into uh, short pieces, usually in the size range of about 200 to uh, 500 bases after size selection. You then add sequencing adapters. Uh, to both ends of those DNA fragments. Then you put them on your Illumina sequencer, sequence from both ends. So one read, you sequence um, the, the, the forward strand, and then the other half of the pair, you sequence uh, the reverse strand. And what this means is that when you sequence these read pairs, they have an expected orientation when you map them to the reference genome. If um, the read pair just comes from some part of the reference genome that matches um, matches well, you'd expect one uh, half of the, the pair to map on the forward strand of the reference and the other half of the pair to map on the reverse strand. This is depicted here with these arrows here. One arrow is facing to the right, depicting the forward, and the other arrow is facing to the left, depicting uh, a reverse strand mapping. Now another source of information that we have is that the um, the read pairs, the, the, the length of these, these uh, DNA fragments that you sequence should come from uh, a distribution that's roughly Gaussian or normal in shape um, with the peak of around, say, 400 bases. This depends on how you sheared the DNA and size selected it. But when we map these read pairs to the reference genome, we can use this distribution to figure out what we ex how far apart we expect them to be. 
And this gives us information as if they map much further apart than expected or much closer than expected, um, they might indicate there's some level of structural variation. I'll give examples of that in the uh, upcoming slides. Um, but just a bit of terminology before we do that. When the read pairs that map to the reference genome are in the expected orientation and the distance between them is consistent with this fragment size distribution, we call them concordant read pairs. They don't have any evidence for structural variation. Um, when they either map too far apart or too close together or outside of this expected orientation, uh, we call them discordant read pairs. And these discordant read pairs are the ones that give some sort of evidence of structure variation. Um, in, in these SAM tools flags that you had a look at, um, there's a bit in there that's set that, depend, that will say, yes, this is a discordant read pair, or this is a, a concordant read pair. And in the lab later, we'll be extracting reads from these BAM files that are concordant, which means that they, or sorry, they're discordant, which means they have some evidence of structure variation. So let's look at some examples of what the patterns of discordant read pairs should look like for various types of structure variation. So I'll be showing these, uh, these simple diagrams of um, uh, some sequenced sample and a reference genome to, to illustrate these patterns. So this is an example of a deletion. So here there's this red part of the genome that's only in the reference and it's not present in this individual that we've sequenced. This is an example of a deletion. Now I'm depicting the deletion in, in the sample on the top is just this dashed line. That sequence isn't present. And the breakpoints are just these red vertical bars. That's where, um, that's where the, this, this deletion occurred. Now when we sequence read pairs from this sample genome, and then when we map them to the reference, because of the fact that the, the genome that we've sequenced doesn't have this red block, when BWA maps into the reference genome, they map much further apart. So when you'd expect them to be 300 bases apart, if this deletion is, say, 500 bases, because of the fact that um, the, the sample genome doesn't have that red 500 base pair piece, they would map roughly 800 bases against uh, uh, away from each other. So that would make them discordant because they don't come from this 400 base pair distribution. And that's evidence of uh, a structural variation, which is a deletion. So the signature of deletions is when the reads map further apart than expected. And later on, you'll be viewing some deletions in IGV, which should, uh, which should help reinforce this point. Now, second type of uh, structural variation signature is an insertion. So here, the sample that we've sequenced has uh, some block of sequence that's not in uh, the reference genome. Again, the, the novel sequence is this red block, and the breakpoint is just this red vertical line in the reference. Um, and when we map these reads, which span the insertion, so there's one read on the left half of the insertion, one read on the right half of the insertion, when they map to the reference genome, they're going to map much closer together because of the fact that the reference doesn't have this, uh, this red block of sequence. So the signature of, of an insertion is reads mapping closer together than expected. Well, some of the, pair, the other pair that need to be within the insertion, in which case you just have the forward mapping and the somewhere else yeah yeah it, it depends on the size of the insertion um, and what the inserted sequence is as well I'll, I'm going to come back to that in a, in a few slides so if you have um, a type of amplification known as a tandem duplication where within the uh, the sample there's two copies of a sequence where they're located head to tail like this if we sample a read pair that's around the point the break point of the tandem duplication when that second half of the read pair maps, it's going to have to map to the start of the other copy uh, of the tandem duplication in a reference. And what happens is that the read pairs point away from each other like this. So whereas we expect them to be pointing towards each other, they point away. So the signature of tandem duplications is this uh, wrong orientation signature uh, that looks like this. Similarly, if we have um, an, an inversion where a bit of DNA gets flipped, um, what's going to happen is that the, 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 the half of the pair that's at the start of the inverted sequence is going to map much further away and in the wrong orientation because this DNA has been flipped in the chromosome. So we get the two pairs mapping in the same uh, direction now and, and, and with much larger size than you'd expect. 
Um, so this is just a summary of the different um, evidence for these in, uh, structure variation types. So for an insertion, the map distance is too small, but the orientation is correct. For deletion, the map distance is too big, but the orientation is correct. And then for inversions and tandem duplications, we either have pairs mapping in the same direction or away from each other. Um, a type of structure variation I didn't mention is interchromosomal re rearrangements. And here we'll have pairs that map uh, to different chromosomes, um, and they can have either uh, any type of orientation. So as we just uh, as, as we just had a question about there, this can go wrong in various ways. Um, one of the ways it can go wrong is missing large insertions. So if your insertion size is much larger than um, than the distribution of your your paired end reads, you're not going to have reads that span across the to the whole insertion. So the reads that fall in the middle of the insertion aren't going to map anywhere and you won't have reads that, that uh, have this distance that is too close together. Um, you might have one pair that map um, that only, where only one pair of the reads maps and the other one is unmapped. That's a, that's a line of evidence that some rearrangement detectors um, will use to find these types of insertion. And how small insertions and deletions can you still detect? So usually there's, there's this boundary between where um, where the, the reads will be split by BWA, where it, will, where it will align with a nice gap in it, and you can detect it off of just the read alignments. You can, usually you can find those up to maybe 30 to 40 bases. Um, but because when, when it's larger events, you're looking for differences between the distribution of the fragment sizes between what you expect and what you actually found. Usually you can find those if it's maybe 100 to a few hundred bases in that way. So there's this sort of gap between 30 bases and 100, where we don't have very good methods to find um, th these type of events. Right, so um, another, another line of evidence for structure variation is, is split reads. This is where BWA has just um, introduced a large gap into the, the read, as I, as I was just explaining. Um, and, and here's an example of where there is a deletion, and the aligner might just split that, introduce this gap uh, corresponding to the deletion. Usually when this happens, these are easier events to find than, um, than when you're just trying to infer it off of the fragment size distribution. Um, so a, a special type of re rearrangement, which is quite important in cancer, is gene fusions. This is where um, you had some rearrangement that shuffled exons around between different genes. And when those genes are expressed, you have what's called a fusion protein. Uh, Andrew's going to talk about this uh, in detail later on. Um, but that's, uh, th this is a very important type, so we've dedicated a whole module to it. Right, so just before we start the exercise, a word about calling um, somatic versus germline uh, mutations. So we have variation in our genomes with respect to the reference genome of all types, SNPs, indels, structural variation. And then on top of that, if, if we have a tumor, um, there's additional mutations that occur. And usually when we're sequencing cancer genomes, we're mainly interested in these uh, what are called somatic changes, which are the mutations that are only present in the tumor genome, not present in uh, our normal inherited genome. Um, so I touched on it earlier, is that usually what we do is we'll sequence both the tumor sample and the normal sample, and then we'll compare them and we'll subtract off all of the events that have evidence in the normal sample as being germline events rather than somatic. And, and th this is an important thing to keep in mind when you're looking at these events uh, in, in, in the next uh, lab. Uh, so we'll now start with this lab.